Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and this is my 112th, more or less consecutive weekly economic outlook, brought to you, as it were, on America's birthday. It's 246th birthday. Well, I fear I'm running out of steam a bit, and I'm clearly becoming excessively repetitive, but I do feel that at least two of the major, on the two of the major issues of the day, I am being vindicated. The first is the geopolitical situation, or more narrowly, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is a tragedy, not just for Ukrainians, but for many in the emerging markets in particular, who depended on Ukraine and Russia for food exports. And more broadly, it's also a tragedy for anyone whose material standard of living was enhanced by globalization, as it was for almost all of us. I don't know if you saw a comment last week by General Motors CEO Mary Barra, who claimed that the company had 100,000 half-finished cars in stock that it can't complete because global supply chains have broken down. Uh, That can't all be blamed on Putin. Some of it's a lingering response to COVID, but the Ukraine war has killed the faltering return of globalization stone dead. It'll be just in case, not just in time going forward from here. And that means we will all pay, including billions of people who really can't afford it. There are still those, I guess, including Liz Truss and maybe Boris Johnson himself, who insist that the only outcome that would be in any way acceptable is a total abject defeat for Putin's Russia and the re-establishment of Ukraine's control over the Donbass and even over Crimea, and perhaps even reparations. But I think now that saner heads are starting to prevail, I quoted Edward Lutwak Lutwak last week. This week, there was an equally important column in the Washington Post by Michael O'Hanlon from Brookings, from the Brookings Institution, uh, that while purportedly summarizing the various potential end games to the conflict, effectively argued for a ceasefire that would leave Moscow in control of both Donetsk and Luhansk and in control of the Crimea, and that would even give a land bridge to the latter with a permanent settlement postponed until a future date when there might be a referendum in the Donbass. Oh, And there would also be a modest easing of sanctions on Russia, at least on natural gas, if not on anything else. The idea behind this would be to give Putin something that he could present to his domestic constituency as a modest victory. Given Brookings' role as, if you like, the brains trust of the Democratic Party, and given the clout that the Washington Post has on Capitol Hill and beyond, this is more than just a straw in the wind. It is recognition by Democratic bigwigs that the Democrats really ought not to define themselves as the war party in town. What O'Hanlon didn't discuss is what we should offer Zelensky in order for him to accept that kind of a deal. I've always said that NATO membership is too provocative, but a commitment to let the Ukraine queue jump when it comes to EU membership would be much, much more attractive. It would also have one collateral benefit for the UK itself. It would make it even less likely that an independent Scotland could realistically hope for EU membership Um, within, say, Nicola Sturgeon's lifetime. After all, if the EU were to take on Ukraine, its headroom for any other expansion would be zero. That should, if it were presented properly, drive a stake through the heart of IndyRef 2. No bad thing. For what it's worth, it would also be a major burden on the EU itself, since the cost of reconstruction in, in Ukraine would run to billions, and, and fellow EU members would have to pick up the lion's share of that of the tab for that. That, I guess, would also be a, shall we say, a collateral benefit of Brexit. Is there any sign that we're moving in this direction? Well, on the surface, no. But last week, 
saw the Ukrainian crisis top the bill at both the G7 summit in Bavaria and the NATO summit in Madrid. Although there was the usual chorus of public commitments to Kiev and the repeated assertion that only Zelensky can say what peace terms Ukraine would accept, I detect a note of realism creeping in. After all, as the IEA's, that's the International Energy Agency's, Fati Biro uh, made clear over the weekend, without some sort of deal on Ukraine, the prospect for Europe this winter is grim. Power cuts, factories shut, political unrest. And to those who insist that the West has no moral right to press Zelensky, well, the obvious response is that we are paying, and he who pays the piper has at least some say over what the tune should be. Plus, a point I made last week, but I, which I, I haven't seen anywhere else, while Russia's manpower losses are exclusively military, Ukraine's are increasingly civilian. Do we have the moral right to prolong a war where deaths are increasingly, shall we say, asymmetrical? Enough about that. Ukraine wasn't the only item on the agenda at either the G7 or the NATO summit. Indeed, at the latter, the most important outcome was probably a new strategic concept, strange word, which effectively makes NATO an anti-Chinese alliance as well as an anti-Russian one. That sort of went through on the nod, even though it was an absolutely fundamental shift. After all, the NA in NATO stands for North Atlantic, we used to have CETO and CENTO. Now all regional alliances are being rolled into one. And that might be tested very serious, very soon if Xi Jinping, who traveled from Beijing to Hong Kong, incidentally last week for his first trip outside mainland China since, since before the pandemic, if Xi Jinping continues to ramp up the tension over Taiwan. Let me turn to the global economy, which after all was the number two issue at the G7 and the number one issue at the European Central Bank's Central Bank Forum in Portugal, at which both Jay Powell and Andrew Bailey put in an appearance. It was also the focus of the BIS's latest, and that's the Bank for International Settlements, latest annual report, which included a stark warning that the West is facing a crisis of stagflation, the like of which we haven't seen since the 1970s. Rather obviously, stagflation conflates two unpleasantnesses. First of all, high inflation, which hurts those on fixed incomes, it hurts the elderly, it hurts disproportionately the poor and disadvantaged, and hence, in my opinion, exacerbates just about all the most dangerous cleavages in contemporary society. And secondly, it means low or no growth, which makes us all poorer, but which again hits the disadvantaged hardest. For a contemporary example, see Sri Lanka, no fuel for three weeks, except of course for government bigwigs, not a recipe for political or social stability. See also Argentina, where I read this morning that the pretty competent finance minister, Martin Guzman, has walked, leaving the uh, field open for, shall we say, a return to power for the uh, less than competent vice president, Christina Kirchner. Watch this space. So how are we doing? Well, on inflation, I guess there are some signs that it might, might be moderating, but they are, in my humble opinion, not very convincing, even if the New York Times' economic guru, uh, Paul Krugman, has pounced on them. In the US, for instance, the PCE price index, that's the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, which the Fed is supposed to watch close, closely, was unchanged at 6.3% year-on-year in May. But the core index actually eased from 4.9% to 4.7%. Given that the consumer price index, which is what everyone except the Fed watches, is up 8.6%, that's, I guess, small comfort, though it might convince Powell and his friends that they are on the right track. We'll see. What ought to scare them is that 52% of Americans now think that they are worse off than a year ago, and they put that down primarily to inflation. 
On this side of the Atlantic, well, the EU published its harmonized CPI data this week, uh, last week, and they are not so encouraging. At the Eurozone level, for instance, uh, the HICP inflation index, which is the consumer price index, harmonized within the, the group, jumped from 8.1% to 8.7%, with prices up 0.8% for the month. In France, the rate was up from 58 to 6.5%. Last month in Italy, it was up from 73 to 8.5%. And in Spain, it jumped from 8.5% to 10%. On the other hand, true, in Germany, the HICP fell unexpectedly from 87 to 8.2%. So not all is lost, though I fear that taken all in all, inflation still has some way to go, given that the PPI, that's the producer price index, is rising at double-digit rates almost everywhere, and labour markets are still very tight. As for here in the UK, well, we didn't have any new inflation data last week, which meant that the press could continue to focus on Andrew Bailey's warning that inflation will hit 11% by year-end. On the other hand, the house price bubble might be deflating at least a bit, with year-on-year -year price rises falling from 11.2%, to 10.7% last month. Now, admittedly, that's small comfort and certainly not enough to stop the Bank of England raising interest rates, but some see it as a straw in the wind. As for the Fed, well, I don't see anyone stopping it from continuing to tighten. Indeed, speaking at the ECB's forum, Jay Powell didn't, in my opinion, mince his words. The Fed, he said, must accept a recession risk in order to get a handle on inflation. Quote, is there a risk we will go too far? He asked, and he answered, quote, certainly. As he put it, and I quote again, our job is to prevent the transition to a higher inflation regime. And in his opinion, recession is a risk worth taking. But will there be a recession? S&P published its final manufacturing purchasing managers indices for June last week, and not one of the major advanced economies was in recession territory. In other words, not one had a PMI of under 50. That said, all, with the exception of Japan and China, reported manufacturing PMIs that were down month on month. So what should we make of that? Well, <laughs> frankly, I don't really know, but I do know, first of all, that the Atlanta Fed uh, has a GDP tracker, which is now predicting that US GDP will turn out to have fallen 1% quarter on quarter in the second quarter, which would actually put the US into what is consensually defined as a recession already. And secondly, that S&P itself now projects that US GDP will have fallen at an annual rate of 1.5% in the second quarter. So ditto. However, that in my opinion, isn't such a sure thing. It was also reported last week in the US that durable goods orders, which are very important, were up 0.7% in May, that pending home sales were also up 0.7%, despite the rise in mortgage rates, and that personal income was up 0.5%. The problem, however, for all's optimists on the economy is that economic the balance of economic releases is clearly shifting. In addition to those, for instance, it was also reported that the conference board's confidence index was at a decade, decade low of 98.7 in June, with the expectations index falling from 73.7 to just 66.4. That's a 40-year low. That and secondly, that the Dallas and Richmond Fed's manufacturing surveys for June were both down sharply. Moreover, and I, I think this was a particularly interesting statistic, gasoline sales by volume were down 8.2% year on year in the first week of June, which is a huge drop. Five buck a gallon, even that's a five buck a US gallon, is having a big impact on operate on driving patterns and indeed on spending more broadly. So yes, economists like Larry Summers are right to be worried.
Uh, it's not a slam dunk, but the balance of probabilities is pretty clearly pointing towards a fairly serious and indeed imminent US recession. If not in this quarter, certain, well, if not in the second quarter, at least in the third and fourth quarters. As for Europe, well, my own view has always been that its economic outlook is actually bleaker than that in the US, both because its economy is more vulnerable to what's going on in the Ukraine and because it's still very hard to uh, devise a single monetary policy that's appropriate for the diverse economic situations of the 17 or 18 Eurozone member states. Hence, the ECB has a built-in bias to act too late and to get it wrong. No surprise, therefore, that the Eurozone's economic sentiment index for June fell, albeit only from 105 to 104. However, to my surprise, uh, it was also reported that both the services sentiment index and the industrial sentiment index actually picked up marginally. I am not convinced. And I note that in Germany, which is, after all, the Eurozone economy that drives the rest, it was reported that consumer sentiment is now at a record low. Still, there's no doubt that last week was, I guess, a bit more encouraging for the ECB and for most EU governments than they had expected. As we hear in the UK, well, Bojo's back from 10 days of high-level first-class international travel. I'll stay away from the latest uh, Tory party scandals, perhaps except to say that Mr. Pincher would almost certainly have suffered an even sharper and quicker defenestration had his groping been, shall we say, heterosexual. But it must be depressing for Boris Johnson to hear the Bank of England's governor say that the UK will suffer, quote, a faster and steeper downturn than its EU neighbours. That's a conclusion endorsed over the weekend by Larry Summers, though he blamed bolshy labor unions rather than Brexit. I'm not quite sure which one of those Boris will uh, blame, I would imagine, the labor unions. As for UK economic releases, well, last week wasn't a particularly good one. In particular, it was reported that business investment fell 0.6% in the first quarter, which doesn't bode well for future growth. That GFK's forward-looking uh, confidence index fell in July from minus 26.2 to minus 27.4, not a big change, but in the wrong direction, and that the current account deficit for the first quarter rose from £7.3 billion pounds to £51.7 billion, far higher than the £16 billion that had been expected by the market. That's one that's important and needs watching. I note that our Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, is now expected to buy, bow to pressure from Number 10 for a giveaway budget in the autumn to take some of the sting off higher interest rate, uh, some of the sting of higher interest rates, lower growth and double digit inflation off the consuming public. But whether he will go along or not, I don't know. The general sense among economists is that the only cure for Britain's current problems is a prolonged period of monetary pain, which I fear is going to test Britain's social fabric like it hasn't been tested for decades. And what will all of this do for markets? Well, the first half of 2022 was pretty terrible. The combination of sharply rising interest rates, um, in higher inflation and a perception that almost all the advanced Western economies are on the edge of recession meant a plunge in equities, particularly in tech stocks, which everybody knew to have been overbought. And in addition, the biggest sell-off in bond markets for 40 years or more. Last week, however, there was some relief, at least on the bond side. In the US, for instance, the two-year note yield fell from 3.08 3 to 284, while the 10-year yield, which is the benchmark treasury uh, yield, fell from 3.4 to 2.89. I'm never quite sure what such a flat yield curve, because it is extraordinarily flat at the present time, what such a flat yield curve portends. But I note that the 30-year yield, that's the long bond yield, is now just uh, 3.12 down from 3.26.
Elsewhere, the yield on the 10-year German Bund fell last week from 145 to 123, while the UK's 10-year gilt yield dropped from 231 to 209. However, the 10-year JGB, that's the Japanese government bond yield, was pretty much unmoved at sort of 22, 23 basis points. So aside from Japan, it was generally actually a good week for bat battered bond investors uh, with government paper looking like the best port in a storm, and the storm is certainly blowing pretty hard. As for equities, however, it was pretty dire across the piece, with the only significant exception being China, which is uh, marching to an, its own drummer at the present time. Elsewhere, the Dow was down 1.3%. The S&P 500, the broader S&P 500, was off 2.2%, and the tech-heavy Nasdaq was down 4.1%. That's a lot. On this side of the Atlantic, the DAX in Germany was off 2.3%. The CAC, the CAC 40 in Paris was uh, also off 2.3%, and our own FTSE 100 was off, well, 0.6%, but that was small comfort that it was lagging the others. For the year to date, this means that the Dow is now off 14.4%, the S&P is off 19.7%, and NASDAQ is off 28.9%. In Japan, the Nikkei is down 9.9%, and here in Europe, the DAX is off 19.3%, and the FTSE, the market leader, is off just 2.9% good for us. In the foreign exchange markets, the, the dollar has been, the US dollar has been the clear winner, up 0.9% on a trade-weighted basis last week and up 9.5% to to year to date. The pound hasn't done so well, but perhaps not as badly as readers of the Financial Times might think. Uh, to be fair, it's only down 2% year-to-date against the euro, which is, after all, its main trading partner, and that's an advantage, a competitive advantage for the UK. The big loser in the foreign exchange markets has been the yen, which is off 17.5% year-to-date against the dollar. That, I don't know what that will mean for the Japanese economy. As for cryptos, well, Bitcoin started last week at $21,500 and ended it at $19,100, leaving it down 59% year to date. With the EU now imposing new rules on crypto platforms and on crypto lenders, and with Gary Gensler muscling into the crypto space with the US SEC, it's hard to see anything other than vindication for us crypto skeptics. But we'll see. I guess I'm more concerned about the macroeconomic outlook for the world as a whole than I am about the fate of the crypto bros. Anyway. Thanks for watching this week, and maybe I'll see you again next week. And if you're American, enjoy the fireworks. Many thanks.